Uh, we are wrapping up our sermon series that we've titled, We Are All Theologians. Now, uh, if you were here at the beginning, you would remember that I said that this is going to be a series that we're going to pick up every now and then and just kind of pick up on some theological truths uh, that we maybe hear and don't quite understand. And uh, maybe for some of us, we've never heard before, but they have a significant uh, impact in our lives. Um, but we're wrapping up uh, today in the first portion or the first part or however you would call it uh, of this series, We Are All Theologians because next week uh, we kick off our Advent series. Can you believe it? Uh, the year has come to an end. And so our Advent series, our Christmas series, as we kind of look towards uh, Christmas, and we're going to have our first gathering uh, this year, our first Christmas gathering ever. Uh, it happens to land on Christmas Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we want to uh, really use this opportunity to invite our neighbors and our friends, our colleagues, uh, folks who aren't going to leave the city are going to be around. I think it's really a time where folks are saying, hey, I don't really like the church. I don't really uh, understand this Christianity thing. Uh, but I believe there are two moments in a year that folks are willing to lean in a little bit. One is Easter and the other one is Christmas. And so let's use this as an opportunity to invite our friends and our family members, our colleagues, our neighbors, and so forth. Uh, on Christmas Day, we're going to gather. It's going to be incredible. But all of it begins next week, Sunday, as we kick off our Advent series. Uh, and so today is the last one. Um, and we're going to be looking at uh, a theological truth that I think is, is, is not only beautiful, uh, but it's so important uh, for us as the church. And if you're a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, it is so important for you. We're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. All right, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, there's so much to be said about the Trinity, uh, and I don't have enough time to unpack it all. And so I'm going to move quite quickly and give you a ton of scriptures. And so if you're a note taker, this is a great Sunday for you. And if you're not, uh, then you're going to have to go listen to the sermon again. Okay, so I'm not going to read uh, all the scriptures, uh, but I'll give them to you so that you can go locate them for yourself uh, after the gathering. The doctrine of the Trinity. And so before we we jump in to the sermon this morning, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you, ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do that which only he can do, uh, and that is save many. And, and so, Father God, thank you so much for your word. It continues to transform the individual lives of people. And so, God, would you do that again this morning? We're in desperate need of a Savior, uh, and his name is Jesus. And so, God, would you uh, reveal him to us by the power of your spirit? God, we love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. The doctrine of the Trinity. Now, if you jump over to our uh, website uh, and go to our statement of faith, essentially it is what we believe. It is our non-negotiables. As the church, we say, hey, uh, there's a lot of things that we will have conversations over and debate over and go, okay, we're willing to be, uh, uh, to be moved uh, on that issue. Uh, there's a ton of things that we say, hey, we're not going to move at all because we believe this to be true, that it is from God's word and it has massive implications for our lives. And the doctrine of the Trinity is one of those. Here's how we uh, define it. We talk about the triune God, all right, three in one, the triune God. Here's how we say it. We believe that there is one living and true God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three, the Trinity, are equal in essence, in power, and glory, and are distinct in function. Let me give that to you again. We believe that there is one living and true God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three, the Trinity, are equal in essence, power, and glory, and are distinct in function. Now, if you've been around the church for a while, if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, uh, you will probably notice that, that churches tend to highlight one of the three, maybe two, and then they tend to neglect the other. And yet it's so important for us to understand all three, because all of them are the true living God. Three in one. Now, I'm going to try to kind of, through the scriptures, show you where all of this comes from, right? That we didn't make this up, that it comes from God's very word. However, no Trinitarian doctrine is explicitly taught in the, New, in the Old and the New Testament, 
All right, it's not explicitly taught in the Old and the New Testament. However, the Trinity is scattered throughout the Bible. It is scattered throughout the Bible that if we read closely enough that we will see it. And so let me show you a few places in the Old Testament. From the very first chapter, we see the Spirit of God being introduced. You see, many of us would go, no, no, we know God is there. Right? We, it's very clear that he is there, but, but, but what about the spirit? The spirit is there. Genesis uh, chapter 1, let me read from verse 1. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And so they, right out the gates, we see the spirit we know the Father is, is present, God the Father is present, but, but what about the Spirit? Well, there he is. Okay, then some of you might go, okay, so where's the Son? If we jump over to the New Testament and look at uh, Colossians chapter 1, we see that Paul tells us that, 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 that it was in and through Jesus that, that all that we see was created. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, referring to Jesus, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And so there's Jesus. But I know some of you might be going, oh, oh no, you've jumped to the New Testament too quickly, you're cheating. That's okay. That's okay. In Genesis, we see God referring to himself in plural pronouns. We and us, again, suggesting that, that there, there's three in one. We see it in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Then again, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, 11, verse 7. And then if we jump over to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, there it is again, plural, plural. While the oneness of God is strongly emphasized in the Old Testament, the word used to describe God as one in the Hebrew scriptures is the word echad. Echad. And, and this word is an, an expandable term that can be used to describe unity in diversity. We hear it in the Shema. It's there in the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Alehenu Adonai Echad. Unity in diversity. Here, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This one is speaking of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the same way, Elohim and Adonai used for God in the Old Testament. These are plural terms. More than a hundred times. More than a hundred times in the Old Testament, there is the mention of the Spirit of God. He is there, present and at work, revealing to us the Trinity. The Old Testament not only speaks of, of God the Father, who is very clear, um, and not only of the Spirit of God, but also the Son. It teaches us of a coming defeater of the enemy. Genesis 3, verse 15. It speaks of a son of man appearing with the ancient of days in Daniel 7. It speaks of a son to be honored in Psalm chapter 2. The virgin birth of a child who will be called mighty God, everlasting father, Isaiah chapter 9. And then the angel of the Lord is acknowledged as God himself in Genesis chapter 16, and again in Genesis chapter 22, in Exodus chapter 3, in Judges chapter 2. We've just come out of the book of Judges, where, where we saw the angel of the Lord, and, and, and it, it's not just an angel, it's not just a messenger, but, but we see the, the, the folks in Judges going, no, this is the Lord himself. What many would refer to as a Christophany, the revealing of Christ Already in the Old Testament, the Trinity. Looking at the book of Exodus alone, the Gospels identify Christ as I am. But if you read the, the book of Exodus, you, you see that God says, no, 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 just, just say to Pharaoh that, that I am. And then Jesus shows up and he goes, hey, I am. Amen. 
the risen Christ, interpreted things concerning himself throughout all of Scripture. Luke 24, verse 27. Is used to prove Psalm 110, verse 1, where, where he's, he's saying, guys, listen, I, I've, I've always been here. I'm not a new addition to what God is doing. I have always, always been here. And so we could look throughout the Old Testament and literally just pick up the Trinity over and over and over again. Likewise, the New Testament contains no explicit Trinitarian doctrine. There just isn't. But however, in the New Testament, we see a clearer view of the Trinity. The Father sends the Spirit in the Son's name, John chapter 14, verse 26. All the Father has is the Son's. And the Spirit declares these things to us. John 16, verse 15, you, you see this, this interplay, this inner working of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Spirit of the Son into our hearts. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Titus chapter 3, verse 6. We baptize folks in the name of, of who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. We're told that through the Son, we have access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. And the Father's love, the Son's grace, and the Spirit's fellowship are always with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, I can put that up on the screen. Here's what it says. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul recognizes the, 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 the relevance and the importance of the Trinity, that, that when you read his letters to the churches, he's always trying to find a way to go, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That it's not multiple choice. You don't get to pick one and run with it. And yet many of us do. Many of us do. Now you see, many Christian theologians Apologists and philosophers have written on the Trinity, drawing countless proof from the scriptures themselves. Right? It's, it's not just a new thing. It's not, uh, it's not Oni who showed up this morning to unpack this. No, there are many who have gone before us who speak of the Trinity, but they draw it from the scriptures. But the, the OG of it all, the, the original of it all, was an African man called Tertullian. His full name was Quintus Septimus Florence Tertullianus. And some of you thought Le Tornolo was difficult. <laughs> but known as Tertullian. He, he was born uh, about 120, 150 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. He, he was born in a place called Carthage, North Africa, which is now modern-day Tunisia. Carthage was considered the second most important region or area, second to Rome. It carried great significance. And that's where this man, this African man, was born. So much could be said about Tertullian. Really, so, so much could be said about this African man. But, but I know some people will tend to go, oh, no, how do you know? How do you know that he's African? And I think that's, that's a good question and an important one to be answered. Because just by show of hands, how, how many of you have been in a conversation with someone where, where they are rejecting the Christian faith and their reason for rejecting the Christian faith is they say that it is a white man's religion? Just show of hands. 
right? And what they're saying is that it's a, it's a Western concept. It, it, it's something that maybe comes from Europe and the missionaries came and they brought the gospel to us and, and, and it's polluted and it's their own message and it's controlling and, and, and they, they say all of that. But, but here's the thing, friends. Here's the thing. The gospel, the go- Middle Eastern, if we're, if we're, if we're going to say here's where it came, Middle Eastern, that made its way south before it went north. About 120, 150 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have Tertullian showing up, a North African. But only how do you know he's African? If that city that he was born in was the second most important city, second to Rome, that means that Rome was still in control. They had colonized much of the known world. Let's call it what it is. And so they had colonized the city. How do you know that he was African? Could he not have come from Rome? Maybe his family moved from Rome to come and live there, to work there. Well, you're partially correct. Historians believe that Tertullian, uh, his father was a centurion, which means that he was a leader in the, the Roman army. I believe this to be true as well, uh, because uh, Tertullian went to go study in Rome, a privilege that was only afforded to those who had Roman citizenship. And so he went and studied in Rome and got the best education at that time. He studied Greek and Latin and he became a lawyer, but didn't believe in the gospel, didn't believe in the good news of Jesus until a radical change happened in his 40s. 40s. Why are you saying that with so much emphasis? Because, because there's, there's folks in here that, that tend to think, you know what, I'm way too old for God to use me to do something significant in my life. God radically changed him in his 40s. And so he, he becomes a Christian. And that literally changes everything for this man. Everything, everything. I'm telling you, in, uh, he was a lawyer and, and a really, really good one. And so he, he comes to faith and he becomes, because we are all theologians, so if you're a Christian, you're a theologian. And so he becomes the first theologian to write theology in Latin. I need you to think about this for a moment. Because, because Latin has so much influence in, in, in what we would uh, say or consider as Western languages. And here you have this North African, and we're gonna come back to that because I know you're still going, but how do you know? How do you know he's North African? We have this North African being the first theologian to look at the scriptures and go, okay, I need, I need to translate this into Latin. Why Latin? Because, because much of education was happening in Latin, and so he was saying people need to read and hear about this. So he's being a missionary. Why North African? Well, I believe his dad was a Roman citizen. Not much is said about his mom. But I believe that if his dad was a Roman citizen, then his mom must have been from the region. She must have been North African. Historians, again, will tell us uh, that Tertullian was Phoenician. Right, he was of Phoenician origins, which simply means that uh, it's the line that comes from the Canaanites. And again, so much could be uh, said about that, but I won't get into it. But also, he was what they called a Berber. A Berber. Now, Berbers were, were North Africans. Many of them had dark skin. And he comes from that line. But again, some of you might go, on it. you're reaching. Give us a little bit more. I will. And here's why I'm laboring on this. I'm taking a few moments to unpack this. One, because I think it's incredible. But then two, it rebuts these statements that are being made that are like, no, 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 this this is a a white man's religion. The Christian faith actually doesn't belong to anyone. That's of first importance. But, But there's a lot happened on this continent. A lot happened, especially in the early days, the early church days. And so why? Why, yes, Phoenician, Bourbon, Roman citizenship? Why would would you say he's African? Well, simply because Tertullian considered himself African. So so we can look at at all the evidence that that maybe is external, but, 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 but if we look internally, you've got a man going, I am African. 
And we see this a lot in his writings. He's pushing back against colonization. He did not like Rome. Not at all. He, he was like, that, that, is, that is not me. What Rome is doing is wrong. And so already, like, j- like out the gates, the death and resurrection of Jesus, in a couple of hundred years, we've got people advocating for, for injustice. Tertullian goes, no, no, this is wrong. What Rome is doing to our people is wrong. If you read a little bit more of Tertullian's writings, and you should. I mean, it's for, it was blowing. I literally, I'd, I'd read a sentence and I'd, I'd stop. I could ask my wife. I'd stop and I'd be like, hold on, I just need, I need a moment. Said, what, what did he just say? He talks about ethnicity. Not the way that you and I talk about ethnicity. He, he talks about ethnicity being, being more than just the color of your skin, more than just, than just culture. He goes, no, no, no. Uh, ethnicity's got to do with how one carries themselves. It's got to do with how one dresses, all the way to how uh, one does their hair. And so when you read that, you go, this man is identifying himself, not with how Rome dresses, or how Rome carries itself, or, or how they do their hair, or, no, 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 he's going, no, these are my people. Here, these Africans are my people. You can, I don't know if you can throw up a picture. There's a picture because, you know, these days, everyone's trying to figure out, like, what, what someone looked like because they didn't take photos. Th- that, for me, is probably the best one that I could find. And still, I think we're going to show up in heaven one day and go, I'm looking for Tertullian. <laughs> and many of us are going to have that picture in our minds. And he'll be like, hello, how are you? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Not you guys anymore, right? Because we've just unpacked it. But I'm telling you, they are. T- you go Google it. You go Google it and you go, mm, yeah, no, no, that doesn't look North African. Oh, it doesn't look Mediterranean mixed with North. It just, it, something's not right here. The man was African. And, and, and he starts writing in Latin, but not, not just in Latin. He starts writing about the Trinity. He's reading the scriptures and he's just blown away by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he, he writes about the Trinity. Now, a lot of theologians after him, I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, have written some incredible things about the Trinity, but you can trace it all the way back to the writings of Tertullian. God's been doing something on this continent for a very long time. And I'm not trying to elevate the continent over the gospel. No, 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 no. But what I am saying is that we have a narrative to tell, we have a story to share. There is so much gospel richness here. And we should uncover it. And so Tertullian writes on the Trinity, some beautiful, beautiful truths on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, works that have been, continued to be used throughout the years. Um, Little side note, um, I'm telling you, if you're a historian here, you're gonna love this Sunday. Uh, If you're not, uh, uh, Kitty Hadi. Um, so there was something called the Arius controversy, right? The Arius controversy. See, uh, Tertullian does uh, a couple years go by, and then a man called Constantine comes into play. Now, there's a lot that's written about him. He was a Roman Empire. Uh, in 312, 313, um, he, he kind of institutes the freedom of religion, because at that point, Tons of persecution to the Christians. If you're a Christian, it was not a good day for you. And so he shows up and he goes, no, 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 no. there's now freedom of religion. Um, the story goes that he had a dream. He was about to go to war. He has a dream, gets a vision. Um, God, uh, he sees a picture of the kind of the, the Greek symbol for the cross. Uh, he wakes up, uh, seeks interpretation, and he goes, okay, I think God's saying well, he's going to give us the victory in this war. He, he tells all the soldiers to put that symbol on their shield. They go to war and they win, and he goes, all glory to God. So the story goes. But anyway, he comes to faith and and recognizes that, look, there's so much influence that the church is having. And and so he just kind of goes, okay, listen, hey, the the church, you guys no longer persecuted. You guys, you're free to do whatever it is you want to do. In fact, I stand for the Christian faith. And, And so it continues to grow. 
right? But I believe that it was going to continue to grow regardless, right? In many ways, sometimes uh, the Christian faith grows more under persecution than it does of, uh, under like comfort, and, and, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. And so uh, freedom of religion, the Christian faith uh, is now flourishing even more. Um, and then there's this guy called Arius. He's from modern day Libya. He shows up and and he says, I've read some things that Tertullian has written and I disagree with him. I don't believe that the son is equal to the father. He says, no, no, no. The son is is a man, just a man who was empowered by God. But we cannot say that he is equal to God and so therefore the Trinity is not true. Now, if he was just some random guy at the back shouting these things and we just kind of continued with our lives, it wouldn't be that much of a deal or of a big deal, but this was growing. People were going, whoa, this is interesting. And a lot of people were beginning to sign up to this theology. And it was beginning to divide the church. Not much has changed, right? There's always something. There's always something. And so it begins to divide the church. And so Constantine, recognizing that a lot of his power now comes from the church, comes from Christians, goes, you know what? Again, this is what I believe as I read, he must have gone, I I cannot have the church divided because that means I will lose power because they love me because I've given freedom of religion. And so he he says, listen, get some bishops in the room. And he says, guys, you need to figure this out. So he invites about 1,800 bishops uh, to to, uh, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. He invites them there to come and and talk about this and wrestle over it. 1,800 and about 300 show up. So not a lot has changed with us Christians. Um, you know what I mean? Just, it's our thing, I guess. Uh, and so 300 show up and he's like, okay, guys, you need to have these conversations. Figure it out. And he leaves the room. And they start talking and they start talking. This actually was what we have come to know as the Council of Nicaea. Right? The Council of Nicaea. Go Google it. Um, and at that council, there was a ton of things that was on the agenda. I mean, they, they were meant to discuss uh, how are we are to understand the Passover and what we have now come to understand as Easter. Like, what do we do there? Uh, on the agenda was also, what do we do with interest rates for the priests? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also like, what? What on earth is going on here? But it was on the agenda. But at the top of the agenda was this controversy. In fact, the reason for the council was because of this controversy that Tertullian had said some stuff and he believed he got it from the scriptures and then here's this guy, Arius, who's also saying, no, 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 I don't see it that way and it's tearing the church apart. So what is true? Talk about it. And so they do. There was a bishop there uh, the Bishop Alexandra from the region Alexandria, um, he, he was kind of leading this thing, but then he steps aside and he has his assistant begin to, to have this conversation with this council defending the truth of the doctrine of the Trinity. And this deacon's name was Athanasius, also known as the Black Dwarf. Now, this nickname was given to him, not by his friends. I don't think they would be good friends if they gave him that name. Um, But it was given to him by his enemies. And I think the name is self-explanatory. He was dark and he was short. And he was African. He was born in Egypt. And so he begins to defend this doctrine of the Trinity. Also from the scriptures, he reads a lot of Tertullian's material and he's reading the scripture and he's like, guys, how can you not see it? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, distinct in function, but equal in power and in glory and in authority and very, very important for us as the church. If we disregard this truth, it changes everything. And so he defends it and he does it, I mean, with passion. These were, some, these were some passionate men. I think what we today would call violent, all right? Hashtag cancel culture. I don't know if you could say that. You go read some of the stuff. I mean, it was intense. These were the, the passionate men, which to me points me to Matthew, where, where it said that the kingdom of God advances and violent men lay hold of it. What they're saying is that, friends, we've got to be passionate about the truth of the gospel. Let's not be idiots. 
but we need to be passionate. We cannot just hang back and allow culture to dictate a faith that we say belongs to us because of what Jesus has accomplished. And so Athanasius, he's going in hard and he, he defends it. Eventually they win. And so they say, no, 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 the Trinity will stand. And so Constantine stamps it and we have the Trinity as we understand it today. Many other African theologians continue to pick up that which Tertullian had written and Athanasius had defended. Uh, saints uh, who've gone before us like St. Augustine or Augustine, depending on where you went to school. There's so many, so many African theologians who've contributed to our faith, to helping us understand, and not just us as Africans, but the world understand the very word of God. This is not a new thing for us. It didn't just happen when a couple of ships showed up, and I'm thankful for the missionaries that showed up. I really am, other than a few other things, like you didn't have to change names of existing things that you didn't discover that we'd already seen. Again, another conversation for another day. But, but, but God has been doing so much. And, 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 and guys, African is not, like when you read his, his, his paper on ethnicity, man, he, he doesn't even talk about race. And I know we've made race a big deal because of all that's happened historically. I get that. But it's so beautiful to read it, to go, no, no, no. This ethnicity's got to do with, with what's around you and how you live life with others. It's beautiful. And so the Council of Nicaea writes a statement about the Trinity that still stands today. Now, it's important to note that the Council of Nicaea did not invent the doctrine of the Trinity. It didn't invent the doctrine of the divinity of Christ. It didn't invent any of these things, but rather the Council of Nicaea affirmed Tertullian's teachings of who Christ is, the one true God and the second person of the Trinity with Father and the Holy Spirit. It's just affirming what the apostles wrote as the Holy Spirit was working in and through them. It just, it just affirms what we see in Scripture. It affirms who God is. Now, I spent some time unpacking this because I want you to know that this is massively important. The Trinity matters, friends. And if we get this wrong, it changes, hear me, it changes everything. There are so many implications to the Trinity. And I could spend hours unpacking them, but we don't have that time. And so permit me to give you three. Let me give you three massive implications for our lives because of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Here's number one. The Trinity is the reason for our community. The Trinity is the reason for our community. Because God the Father, Son, and Spirit were perfectly unified before the creation of the world, loving, serving, and glorifying one another, we can be confident that God didn't create us out of a needy desire to fill an inner relational void, which many of us believe, and I know we don't say it, but we live that way. Oh, God needs me. Why do you think he created me? It's because he needs me. God needs nothing. Nothing. We are created. Humanity is created out of an overflow of the goodness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That they were enjoying one another so much. They were like, man, man. It's like that favorite meal of yours. I mean, it's nice when you, you make it and you prepare it and it's incredible, all the ingredients and Instagram and hashtags and then you sit down and you're about to partake and you smell it and it's beautiful and then you dig in. I mean, it's nice, but when it's really nice, you're like, who can I invite to be a part of this? It's, it's not that I need that person to tell me that Mark's tail is nice. I don't, it's nice. nice but I want to share it with others. Yeah. And so when God creates, when the, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit create us, it's out of an overflow of, of this, this beautiful community that, that has existed throughout eternity, past and eternity forward, and, and, and it just goes, man, it's just, this is so good. Let us make man. 
He was God the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. He was and still is perfectly fulfilled without us. However, he lovingly chose to intentionally create us, invite us into a satisfying and and enjoying and meaningful life with him that is overflowing with his goodness. And so as the church, we are the household of the Father. 1 Timothy 3.15. We are the bride of the Son. 2 Corinthians 11.12. Ephesians 5, 27, Revelation 19. And the temple of the what? The Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. There it is, the Trinity. Our very being leans into, is anchored in, belongs to the Trinity. United with God, three in one, in love, so too, Are we united with his people? Those with whom we are built together in the Son to be a dwelling place of the Father by the Spirit. This is why we say here at Rooted Fellowship, you were never designed to live in isolation. Beautifully made, beautifully made for fellowship. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. Put it up. It says, in him, referring to Jesus, in him, you are also being built together with God's dwelling in the Spirit. There's the Trinity. There is the Trinity. Never made to live in isolation, but rather beautifully designed to live in fellowship. As the three persons of the Trinity are mysteriously united as one, so are all the tribes, tongues, and nations of God's people. It should be confusing to the world how we're able to gather together like this. This is why we are advocates of being a transcultural community. We're unified, and yet we're distinct, each and every one of you. God has beautifully wired and made to contribute to this beautiful community called the church. A community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context, and by the power of the gospel, transcends it to create one new community. I cannot advocate enough. I know some of you are like, no, you know, I come to the church, and it's, it's kind of cool, but my community is my yoga class. My, my community is the golf uh, guys. My community is my drinking buddies. My community is, guys, I'm telling you, there is no community like the church. The Trinity is the reason for our community. The Trinity, second one, drives our mission. The Trinity drives our mission. As we see the Father sending the Son and the Son sending the Spirit, so we see our own great commission as a continuation of the Trinity's mission in the world. John 17, verse 18, Matthew 28. It tells us that we are also sent We are also sent because of the command of the Father, the obedience to the Son, and the empowerment of the Spirit. We are all sent. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, Peter writes this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles, right? And then he lists the places, and then he says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey guys, not only are you a community, but you're on mission because of the Trinity. As each person of the Godhead glorifies the other, we are called to glorify God by knowing him and making him known. At the cross, we see the ultimate glorification of the Father as the Son lays down his own life for us in order that we might receive the spirit of adoption as the children of God. And so what is the call for us? That we too also must lay down our lives. We must lay down our lives for one another in service. And as we do this, we're glorifying God and we're carrying on the mission of the Trinity. And so the Trinity drives our mission. If you want to understand why we talk about mission, why I always say that you're on the greatest adventure of your life if you're obedient to the Great Commission, is because we are are joining the Trinity who has always been on mission to see some of the most greatest things that you will ever see. Let me land the plane. Not only is the Trinity the reason for our community, not only does the Trinity drive our mission, but hear this, 
the marvel of the Trinity should lead us to worship. The marvel of the Trinity should lead us to worship. I'm going to call the band up. Uh, you guys can come up and, and we're going to uh, sing together. But, but, but here's the thing, and, and, and here's why I talk about the, the marvel. Because look, I spent the whole week unpacking this, and I could have spent way more time. In fact, there are those who have gone before me who've done significantly more than I have done in trying to unpack the Trinity. But if you go back to our first sermon in the series, when I was talking about the glory of God, I said, look, we, we are to be amazed. We're to be in awe and wonder of who God is and now I'm tying it all together God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit we are to be in awe of this one true God and and glorify him because he is worthy of all the glory it is like going to the ocean if we're going to understand this and going let me get a, a handful of this water and then to say I now understand the glory of God would be foolish on our part It's the same for the Trinity, that we are to seek to know more of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but to recognize that we cannot fully comprehend this, that it is scattered throughout God's word, but we cannot fully comprehend our triune God. I'd go as far as to say the only God that we, I think, can fully understand is a God of our own definition. And many of us run the danger of that, of defining God by our own terms and by our own understanding instead of what has been revealed to us in God's word. And when you do that, when you try to define God by your own terms and conditions, you create an idol. And hear me, friends, an idol cannot save you. An idol is not worthy of your worship because it cannot save you. It will leave you dry over and over and over again. And so uh, we're about to sing now. We're about to draw near to God. And my hope is that we would, we would marvel. We would marvel. We, we would be in awe of, of like, God has just given us a taste, literally just a taste of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and how they work, how they work not just in creation, but in our redemption, in our sanctification, in our propitiation, in our adoption, in our transformation, ultimately in our glorification. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards, he rewards, he rewards, he rewards those who seek him. You want a reward from God? You must first believe that he exists. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. in awe of who he is that leads us to deeper surrender. Some of us, we're wondering why, why am I struggling to surrender? I hear it week in and week out that the call is to surrender your lives to Jesus and, and your lives is everything, your time, your talents, and your treasures, your ambitions, your goals, your desires. Surrender it all. And you go, I I don't know why I'm struggling. It's maybe because you're not in awe of who he is. And so maybe take a step back and just go, God, I want to be in awe of you. I I I need to get over myself. Get over myself and go, I am in awe of who you are, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that you don't need me. You don't need me. I'm not filling some void in you. You you created me out of an overflow of joy and love and just of service. And I, my, my mind just can't contain it. And so I surrender. The more we marvel at the Trinity, I believe it leads us to, to a, a deeper place of love. Not just loving our Father and our Son and the Holy Spirit, but, but, but it's loving one another. 
Maybe the struggle is because we're not in awe of our triune God. And the more we marvel at the Trinity, I believe it leads us to deeper worship. More than just singing words on a screen. It's where we completely just lay ourselves before the one who is seated on the throne and we worship. I don't care who's around me. I don't care who's in front of me. I don't care what people think about me. It's the audience of one who is on his throne. Maybe it's because when we don't marvel. I want to close by reading from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. The apostle John gets a vision of heaven in its current state. And he sees a number of things. And, 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 and what he sees in Revelation chapter 4 is, is just, it's mind-blowing. He sees these four creatures. I mean, go read it. It's insane. They're covered with eyes. I mean, it's, it's, it, it blows my mind. But he sees them. It says this, Revelation chapter 4 from verse 8. It says, each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And hear this, they cast their crowns before the throne. Now, these crowns are, are, are crowns of reward. It's crowns of reward. And what they're saying is that even in our reward, connected to Hebrews 11, remember, you, you seek God, you access the throne of God, you believe He exists, you receive the reward. And so they're wearing their reward, but even that, they lay it down at the foot of the cross, at the foot of the throne, at the one who deserves all glory and honor and thanks. And my prayer is that all of us, all of us, those 24 elders, they represent all of us, that all of us one day would be able to do so. But some of us are wearing crowns that have not been given to us by our Father. We're wearing crowns that we have created for ourselves. And so before you receive the crown, that comes from the Father, you first need to lay down the crown that you've created for yourself. And, and that crown is, is, is what identifies you outside of Jesus. Whatever it is for you, that thing that if it was taken away from you right now, your entire life would fall apart. That is an idol. I should be able to live life and go, if he takes anything from me, I still have Christ. And so we're going to worship. And my hope is that, that folks in here, if, if you know you're wearing a crown that has not been given to you by God the Father, because of what Jesus has accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit, then I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and then I'm pleading with you that you would lay that down. Lay it down cry out, holy, holy, holy are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy are you. I am in awe of who you are and all that you have done. And then watch him work. Watch him work. And so, Father God, we come now asking that you would meet us where we are. That every single person in here is in a different place. They've walked in believing something. Something. We praise you for those who believe in you. That you are the only one, Jesus, who can take away the sins of humanity. We thank you because that was not 
an idea that we came up with, but rather it was revealed to us by you. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit. Would you continue to reveal more of yourself to us? And then God, I pray for those who maybe for the first time are going to be honest with themselves. Tired of the pretending, of the performing, of trying to do this on my own. And God, I pray that you would soften hearts, open them up, and pour your love into them. There is a grace that covers all sin. And so would you cover us now?